Well, Sue, first, I have to thank uh, Pew and the people who work here. Uh, we're all, always looking to leverage uh, strategic partnerships with universities, with uh, think tanks, the charitable trust here, and we're grateful for the expertise and the data and the evidence that you provide for us so that we can get the most effective use of our taxpayers' money. So thank you for this partnership, and thank you for the work that you guys have been doing with us, not only on this issue, but resilience and other, other issues that, that we are working on and challenges facing North Carolina. Uh, when I took office, making sure that we worked to close the digital divide was uh, one of the most important challenges that we faced. And we developed a program because we knew that more than a million households in North Carolina were, were, were not connected. We also knew that in our underserved populations, that was even worse. And we also knew that 91% of the jobs in North Carolina required some digital skills. So we knew that we had a challenge ahead of us. And we began a program. Nate Denny, Annette, and the team here have been working hard on a great grant program. Uh, this is uh, uh, growing uh, rural access through technology to be able to make sure that we get the fiber across North Carolina and get families connected. Uh, so we began this in 2018 with tens of millions of dollars and began making incremental progress in connecting households and business. But then two big things happened. The pandemic, and then as a result, significant generational funding to help us complete this mission. So what started as tens of millions of dollars ended up being supercharged with hundreds of millions of dollars. And we saw immediately that we were ready for this. We knew that the, the bipartisan infrastructure legislation was coming, but we already had the American Rescue Plan funding there. And we began to use that money plugging into what we had already begun in North Carolina. And that's what gave us a real head start in, in connecting households. Uh, we, we, with GREAT, we've connected almost 140,000 households and almost 4,500 businesses. And we're continuing to work on that every day. And now we're able to couple this money with the federal money, money with bead funding, to, to address this issue. On the ground, Sue, what you had during the pandemic was children who were having to go to the McDonald's parking lot to get internet service to do homework and to connect. Uh, we did a lot of stopgap funding. We worked really hard putting Wi-Fi on school buses and in other public buildings to help children uh, find a way to connect. But the problem was stark. Children who already are behind because maybe they didn't get the early childhood education that we need to get every single child in North Carolina. They had to couple that with the fact that now they couldn't connect like other children uh, who, who were at home during the pandemic. So it became just a glaring problem that we knew we had to address. On top of that, we had people who really needed to see a doctor but were limited because of, of the pandemic and trying to connect people through telemedicine was, was something that began to be new. And then we had small businesses that were working hard to expand and connect to global markets. And as we put these great grant programs in place, we could talk to people who, hey, we're finally connected, my child can do homework, talked to a small business that had more than a 60% increase in sales because they now had access to the internet, had a great product that people just didn't know that much about. 
and people who talk about the life-saving avenue of telehealth, particularly for substance use disorder and, and mental health therapy, that now people are taking significant advantage of this. So it's real on the ground. The numbers are, are stark, but we are making incremental progress and looking forward to taking these funds and investing them the right way in a smart way to make sure that every single household and every single business is connected. So it's, it's actually quite extraordinary that you were so ahead of the curve. I mean, I will say, I'll give us a little credit. We were ahead of the curve as well. We started our broadband program a couple years before the pandemic hit. So I think we did, right? We did. No, so right. <laughs> <laughs> make sure. North Carolina along the way. There you go. But I think it's, it's really extraordinary because um, I'll, I'll sort of return the compliment. Um, I appreciate your appreciation of our our sort of resources and assets, but without partners on the ground who really want to drive change, there's not much we can do. So I think this partnership with North Carolina has really been extraordinary. And so if you look at, excuse me, what you were able to do early, you I think were one of the, maybe the first state to open an office of digital equity and um, digital equity and literacy. So that was 2021, um, just right after the pandemic hit. and. Recently, you all released a report outlining your goals that you're headed for in 2025, which is literally tomorrow, right? So it's a, it's a set of very sort of ambitious goals. Tell me how you're going to get there. Well, first, there's so many people, and particularly, uh, although I'm grateful to the legislature for the help that they have given us, a lot of people look at connection of broadband as fiber only. It's a lot more than that. People also have to be able to afford it. They have to have the devices to use it. And they have to have the skills and training to be able to take advantage of it. And there are so many families who don't have, some of them don't have any of those three uh, requirements to really take full advantage of broadband and many people in our underserved communities. Uh, when you look at a $60 a month uh, internet bill, that's a little more than 2% of the income of more than 1.3 million North Carolinians. So that's a big investment for someone to, to have to make. So I established the first Office of Digital Equity and Literacy to address that issue, to encourage the legislature to also fund efforts to make sure that we do get people trained up, we get people devices, we help them to afford it. One of the most important efforts, obviously, and you guys have talked about it, is the Affordable Connectivity Program, or the ACP. Every week at Cabinet, I have our D Department of Information Technology report to me how many people this week. Because one of my goals is a million households. We're at 861,000 households in North Carolina for people who have signed up for ACP, which is so helpful to them. This, this $30 a month credit to a family that's struggling to make ends meet is a big, big deal. In addition, we work to leverage grants to get training for people and to get devices. I'll, I'll, I'll never forget going to a center where we had volunteers from many of our technology companies that were refurbishing devices. We had people who were there to train people on how to use the internet. And I'll never forget a grandmother and a granddaughter who were there who went through the training, and they walked out the, the, of the training center holding hands, each with a refurbished device, signed up for the ACP program, and with knowledge about what to do. And that's, that's the kind of work we can do by paying attention to digital equity and lit literacy and making sure people get connected. Now you talk about goals, getting a million people on ACP. 
I want 80% of households in North Carolina to be connected to the internet and big goal, 100% of households with school-aged children to be connected to the internet. And you need to look, you need to break it down in, in, into subgroups as well. I think uh, as we look at how far we are, among whites, we're at 76% overall household. Uh, black people, I think 64%. Hispanic, Latino, 68%. Uh, Native American, 57%. So once again, in underserved communities, people of color, we are, we are further behind, which makes the Office of Digital Equity and Literacy that much more important to emphasize that we've got to do it. And I'm, I'm very hopeful that Congress will address this funding of ACP because it'll probably run out in about April of next year. And I'm thinking, we were just talking a few minutes ago, I wonder how many of those 861,000 people will disconnect if they don't have that $30 a month credit. And you gotta, you got to think it's going to be a fairly significant number. So we, we want our effort to be comprehensive, and we're going to continue to work to, to make sure that happens. So let's talk about the ACP for a minute. Um, you and Governor Spencer Cox, who's a Republican uh, governor of Utah, got together and you drafted a letter to Congress to say, please continue to fund the ACP, and talked about how critically important it is. So tell me a little bit about how that letter came together and why you thought it was so important to send this message to Congress right now. We had talked a lot at our National Governors Association meeting about the importance of connecting people to the internet. And we, we began to talk with each other about encouraging uh, connection to the ACP. And it was first about, let's get people to have knowledge of this, and we worked to make sure that they were, they were signing up. But then we began to realize that this money was going to run out. And this was a bipartisan concern. This was a bipartisan concern, and even though we had 26 governors and a bipartisan letter, there, and I do this sometimes too, sometimes present, somebody presents a letter, but it doesn't say exactly the things that you want to say, so sometimes governors will do a separate letter, letter to their de delegations telling them specifically some state issue, and we have a number of Republicans and Democratic governors who are writing separate letters, so this is a pretty big bipartisan issue that we want them to pay attention to. We know a lot's going on, and they're even trying to just keep the doors open, but at some point, they're going to get down and really decide what they're going to do with this next budget. We think the ACP has to be there because we're not going to be able to meet our goals if people don't have this, this extra help. And uh, I don't know if Blair Levin is still here, but yeah, where are you, Blair? My man. Uh, <laughs> so Nate and Jim McCleskey and Laurie Stallard, my, my Washington team, they just told me about your idea of connecting Medicaid to it. Uh, that's a great idea. We got the first waiver in the country to be able to use Medicaid funds uh, for these social determinants, which has been really exciting. You know, the, the example I like to use is, you have someone coming in for chronic asthma, and you keep spending money to treat that person, but why not invest in removing the moldy carpet from the apartment to, to alleviate the issue? And so we, we have that waiver, so I'm going to go back and talk to Secretary Kinsley uh, about maybe automatically enrolling people in ACP Medicaid expansion money, particularly if it runs out, um, you know we have to we have to watch that and be careful about using it. But when you think about the telehealth that's going to be necessary, I, I think that certainly would be uh, an expense and an investment that would that would qualify. So I, I've also appreciated with with the ACP that you guys have helped us some on our research 
on what it is that makes people sign up for the ACP or not to sign up for the ACP, and what can we concentrate on using evidence-based research that can be most effective. And we're going to continue to work with you on that. Uh, I think we were talking about it earlier, but when I first came into office, uh, I knew that state government could be so much more effective if we leveraged the great minds of our, at our universities, at our think tanks, uh, at foundations such as, such as Pew. And so I, I established an office of strategic partnerships in North Carolina, headed up by Jenny Owen. Many of you all know Jenny. Uh, she has helped to band together research groups for us to use data-driven solutions that we know are the most effective investment of taxpayer money. And it's ex very exciting what we've been able to do. She's been on loan to us from the Sanford School since about 2018, and it was supposed to be for a year. And I'm continuing to ask uh, the great Duke University, even though I have on the right color tie, to allow her <laughs> To allow her to, to continue to do this, and we've been grateful grateful for that. But well, we, we want this to continue, and we want it to be effective. Well, that's a terrific idea. Um, you know, this is Pew's 75th anniversary this year, and one of the things we like to say is that we use data to make a difference, not only in the broadband area, but all the issues that we work on. So you sort of touched on this a little bit, but, but dig a little bit deeper on the issue of broadband. How has data helped you sort of develop your approach, your goals, your sort of the way you think about broadband. So, so one of the big things, you guys have helped us on this as well, and in Nate's shop, they've been fantastic. The data from the S FCC was just crap. <laughs> you know, when you get right down to it. I mean, it's when, a technical when, term. Yeah. In technical terms. Yeah. Um, what they said was uh, unserved, underserved, really was, was not good data. So we went to work to help try to map this out and determine really and truly what areas are, are unserved, uh, what areas are underserved, uh, how do we do that? We, we had, I, was, I wrote down some numbers because I wanted to talk about this because I was really proud of it. Um, we had um, our, our Next data, next generation 911 that you guys helped us with. So, because with 911, you have home addresses, you, you have good information. We were able to, to leverage that along with working with the counties. And as Nate would tell you, about every month we'd beat up on the internet service providers to give us the data, give us the, you know, very proprietary about it, but help us understand. And we, leveraged the FCC and kept compiling all of this. And then from map one to map two, we had about 115,000 more locations that we were able to identify. Um, and then also, I think, uh, I can't remember how many underserved we had, but, but well, how many was that, Nate? We've got about 500,000 Yeah, and, okay. And, and then so we, we figure, I think we had the most improvement of any state in the country between maps, and we think it can mean from 300 to $500 million additional for us in bead money right. because we've been able to map it out. And are you going to update those maps? Are they going to be continually refreshed, or are you just holding on to the one you've got? Well, I would imagine we want to continue to improve it. And, and the more that these companies get out there and act, we actually get to the business of actually serving them, we're going to learn even more about their, yeah. that. So I, w I would think we would want to constantly update the data uh, about what kind of service, you know, because we all know now you can have not so good service but still be serviced and, and you know, what, how, how do you describe it? You know, we, we want everybody to have good solid service. Yeah. You talked about the ACP, um, and you talked about the infusion of resources that has been sort of unprecedented in terms of supporting access. Um, it feels like we're in an interesting and kind of unprecedented area of federal policy when it comes to broadband. But also, I think the federal-state relationship is quite 
um, robust in this area. So tell me a little bit about why the state-federal partnership matters, how maybe it could be, how can we continue to improve it? Well, the number one way it matters is we need the money. money. From, right. from we, we, we need the, <laughs> let's just lay it on the table. Yeah. We, we need the resources to move from tens of millions to hundreds of millions. And I'll just say, stepping back a moment, that the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act, the American Rescue Plan, the Inflation Reduction Act, the Chips and Science Act, unprecedented in the investment that is being made uh, in the United States and in the people of this country. Extraordinary. And I think that this is one of the greatest challenge that we as governors face when we talk about this cooperation, is making sure that money is invested in the most effective and efficient way for the taxpayers. And, and to make sure that we get the most out of it. Because when you have so much coming in, sometimes it can be easy to not be as careful as you should be because you also want to be fast. Yeah. And that's what's good about high-speed internet for us is that we had the program in we place ready. that we yeah. were ready to plug in this, this money, which, you know, alterations along the way as we learned and uh, as we were talking about, you know, we had to fit our program into the, uh, the rules and getting changes from Treasury. Thank you to the Washington team and, and all of us continuing to work on, on opinions that, that ha made sure our plan fit in. But we were like, guys, this is something that really, really, really works. Let's don't stop the money because of, of a technical glitch that we think may not exactly fit in what we're doing here. But that responsibility that a governor has to make sure that this money is invested in the right way is one that is monumental. And in that partnership, the feds are going to rely on the states mostly, and not just the states, but the partnerships that the states are able to form with universities, with private businesses, to, to make sure that this is done the right way. And you know, my staff knows that we're not leaving one dollar on the table. Every competitive grant that North Carolina has a chance to get, we want to be a part of it. And you know, what I like about a lot of this federal money is that it does make you pay attention to underserved communities. It makes you pay attention to our great diversity that makes us richer. And if you don't pay attention to it, you don't get the money. So this is something we're doing anyway, because I think it's the right thing to do. But with federal policy uh, working as a leverage, right. then I think you're going to get some states that say, well, we want this money, so we got to do this. I think that's a, that's a really good thing. And it, it can be a, a, a fantastic partnership. For, obviously, for making sure we expand broadband, our relationship with the, the FCC is going to be continue to be important in working with them to make sure this is implemented in the right way. We all have a vested interest in making sure this works across the country. And now, post-pandemic, it's, it's an essential utility now. It should be right there with lights and water and everything else. It's something that every family needs because of uh, magnified by, by the pandemic because it, it, it tossed us ahead a decade at least, yeah. at least, maybe, maybe even more. So I think one of the goals that you had that you're hoping to accomplish by 2025 is to be in the top five states for a high-speed Internet adoption. Yes. I don't know where we are now. But I was going to say, where are you now? We're, we're are running you hard. It? Where are we? Consider 85% more. So yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Impressive. So we're yeah. All right. All right. Well, anything else that you would like to share with all the folks here about what's going on in North Carolina? Well, I, I want to thank, thank everybody for being here, for taking these ideas and going back to wherever you live and trying to, not just North Carolina's ideas, but the ideas that have been brought out today by, 
by everybody. This is such a critical issue that is connected to so many other things to help make sure that we secure families uh, across the United States and making sure that we're doing the right things with taxpayers' money. And I, I appreciate gatherings like this where great ideas happen. You know, I, I love to be in a room where people are bringing out good ideas. And, you know, to have good ideas, you got to have, you know, four bad ones to, to have a good... More than to, that, to, in my you, you're probably right. It's probably <laughs> one, one in ten. But to be able to think them out and to, to, to research them and to, to see what's working, this continued collaboration is important for us all to see what, what is effective. So uh, charitable trust has been an important cog in what we have done, and we, it's why I wanted to come up and to say thank you, but also to say we need, need your continued help and look forward to that. Well, you will absolutely have that, and I will say um, it has been such an honor to work with you all. Part of our work in terms of helping the federal government make some of the changes that they have made has been built on the impressive work that you've done in North Carolina. So we are grateful for that. We would not be where we are today without you all, and you are an inspiration. So thank you. Thank you, Sue. Thank you all. Thank you, guys.